This is the Friday Rugby Preview on Borders Rugby Radio with Stuart Cameron. Hello and welcome to the Friday Rugby Preview Programme, taking a look at tomorrow's games in the Borders. I'm Stuart Cameron and with me is Dale Clancy and let's begin with the Super 6 where tonight Southern Knights have a home game against Heriots at the Green Yards. Now plenty of enforced changes to the squad, it's not been a, a great season for them in terms of injuries. Yeah, they've had a they've had a difficult campaign. They had a difficult sprint campaign where um, you know I think they have been feeling the effects of the mass exodus after the kind of Rob Christie era. They lost a lot of players up to up to the capital city, likes the Heriots, and are, are one of the teams that have benefited from you know the players going up to um, play the rugby in the in the capital. So it's been a bit of a transition for for the Southern Knights, and they've been unlucky with injuries as well. Harry Borthwick getting injured. Aidan Cross also was uh, injured recently as well. And Good to see him back. Yeah, and good to see him back in the squad because, you know, he's one of the... Him and Sam Derrick are two of the players that really stood out in that one for uh, for Melrose, and it's good to see them get a shot. So, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for these the, the players to really gel and, and, and get used to playing at that high level. But, you know, they've, they do have players like Sir Charlie Shield coming in at scrum half, which hopefully gives them a little bit more of a you know an experienced head at nine to to get the best out of these young players. But it's a difficult one. But they you know they've, they've yet to win at home. Uh, they've they've suffered a couple of heavy defeats, but they've won one on the road um, against Sterling Wolves. So they'll be hoping to try and you know get a, get a win under the belt against a Heriots team who kind of flip flop between being really good and uh, being quite error strewn as well. Well, no rugby in Scotland last weekend for obvious reasons, so a little bit of a disruption to proceedings, but we're back with a full programme this weekend and a chance for clubs to obviously to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen in their own way. Yeah, you know, I think that there was obviously a little bit of a traditional approach to what has turned out to be a bit of a modern issue. You know, when Elizabeth took the throne all those years ago, we didn't have the international tournaments and the travel that we do today. And I think perhaps the... You know, some some sports opted to to take a week off. Um, other sports opted to to pay their respects by by going forward. I, personally, I think there'd be nothing better than to see the you know the the full stadiums you know fall silent for for a minute and and show their respects that way. But you know that's the kind of that was going to be the protocol anyway. You know, it was meant to be a complete wipeout of all sport. But it's different times and it gives the the clubs a chance. You know, it, even clubs like Southern Knights maybe got a chance to kind of bring some bodies back to play some rugby this weekend, but it'll give the clubs a chance to, you know, pay respects in their, their own way. We've been hearing a, a few positive comments coming from certain quor- quarters that we may well be seeing at long last, the long-promised cross-border competition soon involving Welsh clubs. Have you heard anything at all? I've heard nothing. I've, I've, nothing just at then, all? Just then, that's the first I've heard. <laughs> so we're not going to get anything out of you? No, you're going to get nothing out of me, but, you know, I think that that is, it's a, it's a promising step. It is something that I think is needed because the Super 6, as much as, like, I'm a big advocate for it, I think the step up in quality is really good. You've been able to get all the best players in a smaller pool of clubs, which I think is really important. You know, we, we do cry about the, the, the level of the Scotland under-20s, but it's got to come in time. They've got to be playing at a better level. But I feel that the Super 6 in itself might stagnate slightly because of the, the lack of attractive fixtures. You know, playing each of the clubs half a dozen times is, is not attractive to a fan base. When you've got trips away, when you've got good quality opposition coming up, I think that, that adds to the spectacle that could be the Super 6. So if that's something that is going to happen in the near future, then I certainly welcome it. When Super 6 first started, they were all very close games. Now, this season... There's been a bit of a divide, hasn't there? We've seen Ayrshire Bulls, we've seen Watsonians get big, big wins over the likes of Burnham UBS, 40 odd points on them. And then Sterling Wolves and uh, obviously these other Knights um, down towards the bottom area. And all this talk of Super 8s and Super 10s in the future, well, at the moment, it looks like a Super 4. The, the two teams certainly, um, Southern Knights and Sterling Wolves, have, have found it difficult this campaign. I think initially when it did set off, before COVID as well, they spread the talent pool pretty thin in terms of a lot of clubs got a, a fair share of really good players. Melrose at the time, um, you know, the players moving from Melrose to Southern Knights, they almost had limited competition because uh, of the prestige that Melrose had had in their, their old identity as, a, as an amateur club. Southern Knights were looking to carry that through. And I think after COVID and when times move on and the experienced players move, this is a new breed coming through. And I think that a lot of clubs like Ayrshire Bulls, are, they can attract a really good pool of players 
because of their location as well. They're, they've got no competition, really. Stirling Wolves should almost be the same, but, you know, the, the three Edinburgh clubs are, are kind of cutting each other's throat, but Watsonians seem to have a, a great, great buy-in. But you do lose the, the attraction, like London Scottish, I know we're mooted for a while, we're going to perhaps be one of the teams and perhaps a, a, a professionally aligned team as well, but I think the London, London Scottish ships sailed, but the games are starting to get a little bit wider. You can see the now the Bulls and you would say Watsonians are the two teams that are going to be in the top two. Then you've got Heriots and Muir, and then you would say Wolves and, and, and Southern Knights will probably be at the bottom but it's starting to take shape I think as to, to what the, the club's focuses have been in this short time. OK, let's have a few words from the head coach, Bruce Rutherford. We have a few players returning back from injury, namely Paddy Harrison, Robbie Chalmers in the centre, Corey Winters comes in and makes his starting debut on the left wing, Edinburgh pro players Charlie Sheil, Jamie Jack and Luan De Bruyne come in. Um, as Edinburgh through the pro draft, which will be welcome additions to the squad. And yep, yeah, we're, we're in confident mood going into tomorrow night. We know Heritz will be another challenge for us, but we feel we've had another good week's training and look forward to the challenge ahead. Bruce Rutherford and the game kicks off at 7.45 tonight. Down at the Green Yards, it's Southern Knights against Heriots. Well, our commentary match last week was supposed to be Selkirk versus Jed Forrest, and it should have been you commentating. <laughs> Obviously, that game was postponed and will now take place on November the 19th during the autumn test window, uh, along with uh, the other Premiership matches. So tomorrow, our commentary match will be National One Encounter between Gala and Aberdeen Grammar, who were relegated from the Premiership last season and have started the season with a 2014 loss at Kelvin. So, so another trip into the borders for them tomorrow. Yeah, it, 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 Aberdeen uh, Grammar, I think, are an interesting team because they they were well out of their depth in the Premiership last campaign, and they've they've had to go through a lot of changes of personnel, and 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 they're perhaps a, an area of the country that often gets neglected. They're flying the flag for the the kind of the Caledonian region, um, so they'll be wanting to come down and, and put in a performance. But it's a good start for Kelso because to play a team coming down from the Premiership, you don't really know what they're going to be like. Have they lost a lot of players? Have have, have people moved on? Have they brought a lot of players in? Because a lot of the time they're reliant on the university as well to bring some players in. So, you know, that's a it's a difficult game for both those teams because Gala have really really high hopes of what they're going to do this season, but. I'm sure Aberdeen Grammar will be wanting to try and get a, a win on the board and get things moving from there. Well, let's hear from uh, head coach of Gala, Stuart Johnson. Looking forward to Aberdeen coming down to Netherdale on Saturday. They'll be looking to get their first win of the season after an opening day defeat to Kelso. And obviously, we're looking to continue that uh, start that we had with a bonus point win against Watsonians. Uh, team-wise, it's a very settled starting team from that Watsonians fixture with... The added benefit of you and Dodds, Stevie Cairns and Andrew Mitchell all coming back into the mix on the bench. So, Aberdeen yet to play at home, Gala's second home match. Yeah, that's, you, that's kind of what you would want to start a campaign, especially after falling just short last year. You would want two home matches to, to, to try and get some momentum and some confidence. And, you know, having the likes of you and Dodds coming back in the squad is also another confidence boost. He's a, he's a player with masses of experience and masses of ability. And I think, you know, it's nice to see him coming back to Netherdale. He's obviously been away at Watsonians and whatnot. But, you know, it's nice to see him come back to his home club and, 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 and really contribute. And he knows that he's probably not going to be a starter every single week. But um, he brings a lot of experience. And I think that's what this young team need. They need people like that. Like like Jono, the, the coach, he's he's a relatively young coach. You know, he's he's uh, he's got aspirations of, of being successful as a coach as well and wanting to put a stamp down so... They've got that good nucleus of, of experienced players and especially experienced players from the borders. So, um, difficult game for them, but I think uh, Gala will be certainly hoping they can get another one. And Gala really are targeting this promotion. There's no question about it. But it's not going to be handed to them on a plate. Um, there's a lot of hard work to be done. Yeah, especially because... Uh, most of our border clubs seem to have been uh, stuck in that league. You've got uh, Melrose and Kelso in there as well. And it's always difficult when it comes down to those games. They, those are sometimes the games that dictate who goes up and who goes down from, from that league, not just the borders clubs, because teams end up cutting each other's throat, as uh, we've known to to see over the last few few years with borders clubs. But Gala, they've certainly they've turned a corner and they're a team that... I've I've said it time and time again. There's a team that over for when I first started doing this, I didn't really enjoy watching them because I thought that they they lacked a bit of direction after George Graham. But they do have a identity now, along with Kelso. And, and Melrose are, are, are now finding them in a new guise. Well, Robin Purdy and Sam Matthews will be our commentary team for that one. Let's turn to the Premiership then, and Selkirk, a win and a draw for them, and a tricky trek to Stony Hill to face Musselburgh. Let's hear what head coach of Selkirk, Scott White, had to say. Boys are looking forward to it. I mean, you know, you look at uh, Musselburgh's results over the first two weeks, and you've got to 
appreciate who they've played. You know, they've played Curry and Mar, and yes, they're sitting with two from two, but I don't think you can read too much into that given, you know, how good Curry and Mar were last year. So, you know, they're back at home as well. They'll be desperate to get their campaign up and running. So we appreciate how hard it's going to be. Um, they'll be a slightly different kind of squad this week for herself as well. Just James Betts getting married this weekend. So wish him all the best in his big wedding day on Saturday. And there'll be a few players missing, but you know, we can't underestimate what Musselburgh bring. They've scored a lot of points the first two weeks. So, you know, it's up to us going up there, playing our own game plan and not getting um, pulled into kind of any of the nitty gritty stuff. Hoping to come away from Musselburgh with some points. OK, that's uh, the view of Scott White. A third game unbeaten and the confidence will certainly grow. Yeah, and I think after last season, I, I, I did say that, you know, if the results don't go their way, that Scott White would be under a lot of scrutiny and he's he's started very, very well with Selkirk. I've been really impressed because those two games that you start with, Hoyk, who, you know, everybody had high aspirations for for this season, you start with a draw away from home and then you play Hawks, who are a very physical team and they managed to beat them in a tight game but they're the tight games that they lost last year I think if they can get another result it'll be it'll be great for their confidence you just wonder how much impact the James Bet wedding will have obviously we hope he has a, a cracking day <laughs> but it'll be better if uh, you know his teammates can, can get the win on uh, on the road so that's Selkirk at Musselburgh. Jed Forrest, now they're at home to Glasgow Hawks this week and they'll certainly be looking for points here's head coach Andrew Brown uh, the next two weeks uh, for us are, are fairly important um, to get results. Uh, I feel that we were we were quite unlucky against Hoyk to get nothing from the game, given that uh, given that we we held them to a nil in the second half. Uh, mistakes cost us dearly. We need to iron out those mistakes. Um, training's going well, and I feel that the that that we're heading in the right direction. I don't think we're too far away from getting the result that we want. Um, team news wise, uh, Harry Meadows is back after having a bit of a back issue uh, towards the, the latter end of pre season. Um, also, also, along with Ben McNeil, who uh, is a farmer busy with, uh, busy with farm work and harvest, etc. But the, both of those will, will, will bring tempo and, and both are quite dynamic, so they should, should get us going forward. Uh, Don Buckley will be starting at 10 again. Um, I thought he controlled the game really well against Hoyt, given that we were under a bit of pressure from the pack. Fortunately, Rory Marshall isn't available, uh, but it gives us a great its a great chance to see Lewis Walker at 13, who uh, I think if we get the ball to him in space, then, um, you know, then we'll be able to do some damage. Lewis and Gregor aren't available this week either, but that gives the, the energetic, youthful pair of Lewis Elder and Owen Cranston chance to get on the field uh, and they'll join uh, Robbie Shearer Gibb in the back three. Looking forward to the game again. Two home games coming up. Massively important to us to uh, to get the result that we need. Yeah, absolutely. Thoughts on Jed Forrest then? Really crucial game. Yeah, um, I never thought I'd see a day where Ross, uh, Ross Nixon and Don Buckley would be lining up as tens <laughs> as their, for their... But it's great to see them do it and I, I, I was listening to the to the coverage of the the Hoyt Jed game on the way up, and and the it was coming across like Don Buckley was playing very very well at ten. He's a really good rugby player, all round rugby player. He's played back row, he's played in the centre, you know, and he can play at ten. He's he's an intelligent player, so you know it's it's just it's one of those difficult positions with Jed. You know, when they lose a couple of players, obviously the youngs aren't there. Um, when they lose a couple of players, it's it it, it does sometimes become quite evident that they do have voids in their squad, uh, but. I, th- I think they, they, they certainly seem to be going on the right track, but in the Premiership, you don't get a lot of time to get on the track. You need to make sure that you pick up those points at home and away from home. You pick up any points you can because it can become a bit of a dogfight if you leave it too late. But they'll be hoping that they can pick up some points. I think the, the shift across to 13 as well is, is an interesting uh, move because I've been very impressed with him in the sevens. I think if you can get him in some space, you know, he's a good playmaker. He's got a good turn of pace as well. It'll just be defensively how that 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 kind of pod operates but he's, he's he's good in the open channels I think he'll be pretty good to watch at 13 Well Ewan Welsh will be covering that one for both Borders Rugby Radio and Borders Rugby Television National 1 already uh, covered Gala v Aberdeen what about Kelso the home to newcomers GHK here are the thoughts of Kelso Director of Rugby Neil Hennigan Yeah we welcome GHK to Poynder Park on Saturday um, a game we're, we're really looking forward to and we were expecting a, a very difficult game. Uh, GHK boasts some some really good players like Sue 
Craig Guzman and Tommy Spinks, uh, Grant Anderson, guys like this that have been around the block a, a fair bit and uh, played at the highest level, really, especially in club rugby and some uh, played a bit of pro as well. So the, these these teams like GHK that have just came up from National Two are uh, are certainly a force to be reckoned with, and it's one we won't be taking lightly. We think it could go to the wire, so we're going to have to be really up for it and uh, expect a, an 80-minute performance to get the win. On the selection front, pretty steady team, obviously, last week didn't get a game, so the team's not changed an awful lot, but uh, one of the guys been away on holiday, Greg Ponton, he steps out, and Liam Herdman returns to the Kelso um, side, which he's not featured in for two or three years. He's been down in Cardiff at Cardiff Uni, uh, and he's returned home. Um, he actually lives across the road from myself, so been in dialogue with, with Liam, and he's been back training for about a month now at the club. So, yeah, he's had to wait a little bit to get in the side. Uh, he was meant to feature for the seconds last week against uh, Jed, but obviously with that game being called off, he, d- he didn't get a run out. But things have worked in his favour for selection with, with uh, Greg Putton being unavailable. So we'll see how that goes, and uh, yeah, we'll just we're just going to go out and. You know, try and get two from two and, and build the season from there and, and, and see where see where it takes us. OK, that's Neil Hinnigan. Certainly not taking GHK for granted, and rightly so. Yeah, they were they were really good in uh, National 2 the year before. They had a couple of difficult battles against the likes of Peebles who were in that league at the time. But yeah, they, they're, they've got a lot of influence from their location. And I think the people involved in that club at GHK, obviously, Tommy Spinks is one of the players that you mentioned. Peter Wright is still there. They've got you know a lot of um, ex-professional influence in that squad. Uh, so you know they're they're going to be they're going to be a, a force to be reckoned with. But you know they started with a, a narrow defeat away to Stu Mel in their first game. So they they they'll be wanting to get a, a victory. A pointer, a difficult place to go for any team. But it's uh, it's one of those environments. Like say Peter Wright will will you know he'll be able to have a positive influence on GHK. But it can also are another team. I, I, I probably the last couple of seasons I couldn't praise high enough in terms of the way that they play rugby and the way that their their club has grown again. Um, so it's going to be a difficult game. But it can also very well led, very well guided by their, their coaching staff and the, and the players. And I don't think, you know, Greg Ponton's a good player, but I think they're a bit different to Jed. I think that they do have players that can rotate and come in. Um, so that hopefully doesn't have too much of an impact on their overall squad. And over 50 boys at training last time out. I mean, that, that's impressive, isn't it? And and you only get that amount if, you know, there's a good attitude there. Yeah, you only get that amount if people want to do it. And, you know, the people are not forced to go to rugby training and do it. And there's obviously an appetite and a hunger there. And they're, and they're fortunate as well that they, they have that pool of players that are wanting to come. But, you know, there's a youngster like Aaron Lunn. He was, uh, he's a Duns player. He's playing in the twos. Um, but he's then moved to the town and, and took a bit of time to come out of Shell to go, look, I want to go and play. I spoke to him, he was an electrician at the college, so I kind of knew of his rugby background. And you see his name on team sheets now. So he's obviously, you know, it's it's part of it. The clubs are community clubs and Kelso are a club that do it probably as well as anybody that they open open up to say, look, come, come and play rugby with us. We'll look after you, you'll have fun. And, you know, that's how these clubs should work. So it's it's great to see. Well, the other National 1 game involving a border side, Melrose hosting Watsonians, both lost their first games of the season. Here's head coach Bert Gregg. Yeah, looking forward to the game versus Watsonians this weekend. A few boys returning from injuries and unavailabilities last week with uh, Ben McLean and um, Calm Cruikshank's been available in the forwards and um, unchanged in terms of our, our back line and our, our, our bench. So looking forward to what will be a, a tough account of versus Watsonians. Both of us lost the first weekend um, of the season, so both of us will be going out for something to play. But um, boys have prepared well this week and playing at home on the green yards, I think, uh, will give us the edge and boys will be coming out firing to make sure we get the win. OK, Melrose also without a win in their opener at Stirling um, two weeks ago, looking to step up against the team that lost to, to Gala. Yeah, um, I think Melrose is, is a club that over the last few years has probably been a team that's been discussed quite a lot for various things because of the changes that Super 6 have brought around. And I feel that they've acclimatised quite quick. Um, after what was quite a difficult start. Obviously, players like, say, Bruce Colvin and David Colvin, who did stick around, Richard Ferguson, who's now obviously retired. But these players did stick around and help kind of steady the ship. And I feel like some of the other teams have maybe not benefited off of that. And it allows Bert Grigg the opportunity to then grow his team and put his influence and his stamp on it. Um, obviously, both got off to a difficult start. And Watsonians are always a difficult team. So it's going to be... Uh, 
another interesting game, but Bert said it there, you know, the influence and the, the, the background of playing at the Green Yards is something that all, all players like. It doesn't matter if you're from Melrose or not. So um, they'll be looking to that to have a positive impact on his team and, and hopefully they can get their first one of the season. Well, International League 2 in history will be made at Megatland. The first time Buramuir will play Berwick at senior level. Uh, Buramuir National 1 last year, Berwick National 3 last year, Berwick's first game this season. Here's one of the Berwick coaches, Paul Pringle. The boys have put in a really good pre-season and we've been working hard to keep the team sharp despite the unfortunate three-week gap from our last pre-season game. Colin has challenged the lads with a lot of new things we want to bring into our game plan and it'll be interesting to see how they implement it on Saturday. Numbers are strong at training, this has given us a few selection headaches, but in terms of team news this week, we are missing Darren Goodfellow who's on holiday and his brother Ryan who unfortunately fractured his foot at training on Tuesday night. Missing in the backs is Rory Hindoff who is also on holiday. Rory has recently returned from a season playing for Musselburgh in Prem 1, which is a massive boost for us and he's already having a positive impact in training. Cam Hill will start a hooker after his summer move from Duns and he's already shown that he's fitting in well with the team and showing that the step up in level will not be a problem for him. Carl Gullen and Liam Robson will also get their league debuts after an impressive last season with their twos and a strong pre-season. All in all, we're expecting a tough game, but it's one we're really looking forward to. Paul Pringle there, nicely prepared statement I think he was reading there. Uh, can Berwick start off with a win? This is the big question. I don't see why not. I think they, they've, um, you know, even though they were in a different league, like there was a, obviously a league sandwich between these two teams last year, it's amazing what a, a run of results and some positive results will, will do to a squad and, and it's the exact same argument for Birmingham. You know, they've obviously had a negative impact on their, their season last year and that can still have a hangover when you when you move down a division. It's difficult when you go down the leagues because the things that you're you're maybe so structured, Birmingham are a very structured club. So, you know, when they're playing Super 6 and the, the whole fabric of that club, they play rugby very organised. Sometimes when you go down the leagues, that can be to your detriment and if you play organised rugby when you're brought into a bit of a dogfight and you play against players who play off the cuff and have got a bit of imagination they can cancel each other out so this is a, a an interesting test for Berwick um, because they're playing a, a club who you know have won the Premiership years ago um, you know they've won Melrose Sevens years ago they've, they've got a lot of history uh, but I don't think you can gauge how, how successful Berwick will be off the back of this game win or defeat it's it's just one of those games that this this league certainly has got to take a bit of time to pan out but you know Berwick will be disappointed that they couldn't get their first game um, of the season they couldn't get that uh, obviously uh, under their belt but we'll just see how they see how they go well Burmier started off with a, a loss to Preston Lodge quite heavily in fact so Berwick will certainly be um, having a look at that one but uh, knowing Colin Young and, and the staff as well they'll be taking nothing for granted they'll play their own way and they'll try and beat them on their on their terms yeah, I think Berwick have managed to turn around what was probably a slide down the leagues um, and they've done well to do that. And I think people like Colin Young have, 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 have stayed there for the test of time. He's been through the good things and the bad things. Bringing Hindhoch back from uh, Musselburgh as well is, is one of those things that, you know, he's a player that's went and tested himself. He's went away and he's he's had a shot and he's tried it and he wants to go back to his club. And I think that is, that's excellent to see. Um, it's not like you're, you're failing or doing anything. You've just went, you've tried it circumstances change but he knows he can go back to his club and they welcome him back with open arms Berwick are similar to Kelso they're very very good at welcoming their players back because they know that a lot of them get swallowed up by by other clubs in Scotland Well Hugh Brown will be at Megatland covering that one for us now, Peebles, they've got a home match against Dumfries. Dumfries got a bit of a pasting on their first game of the season, but uh, Peebles won against Carthur Queen's Park. That was at uh, that was at home. A man who's certainly enjoying life at the Guides at the moment is head coach Ian Chisholm. Look at coaches, players, the club. We're looking forward to showing what we're about this weekend. Um, after missing out on a fixture against Kirkcaldy last week, uh, we were we were really excited to go up there. Um, felt we had a real opportunity to get a result. Looking at this weekend, Dumfries, you know, they've always been a big physical side. Um, we've traditionally been really strong at home and, and they'll they'll look to have a go up front. Um they, they they took a heavy defeat in their season opener against Falkirk, but I don't think we can read too much into that. There's loads of variables that could have played into that. We've had a good couple of weeks of training. Um our running volume's been really high. Um we've been a, a wee bit more contact than we usually would and we've just been nailing down our detail and our micro skills leading it if we can. But look if we if we get our attitude and our effort levels right this weekend, I'm confident that we, we can put in a, a real positive performance and, and if that happens then the result will come. John Napier comes into the, the starting squad after look he's been training really well and the and he's not had an awful lot of game time um on the games that we've had so far against Kelso in the Border League and 
uh, Cartha at home, but when he has, he's impressed. Ryan McConnell, he he comes out in the starting lineup. Um, John Gray make up our front row. Uh, Rowan McKeever comes out in the starting lineup after training really really well and having having a few good showings. And and Kenny Clyde comes into the starting squad as well, which means Kami Pai moves to moves moves to blindside flank and he moves to six. And and Rob Harrison, who just a ball of energy, moves onto the open side with Roddy Guinea at number eight. Um, Dave Collins and Donald Anderson keep their places at half backs with James Dow, um, Buster Davidson, and Hamish Barber in 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 the back three. Uh, Adam McDonald and Jack Harrison continue their partnership in in the centres. We've got a really experienced bench with uh, Willie Aitken, Andrew Brown, and Ross Brown making up the forwards on our bench with 17 year old Frey McKeever coming in. Um, we're excited to see what Frey could do. I thought we very much thought it was horses for courses last week. He's got a he's got a really uh, long range in his kicking game and. And felt that with the weather and the type of team that Kirkcaldy were, that we'd be using him a lot. Um, we, we expect the the weather to be a wee bit better this coming weekend at the Guides, so he'll come out of the pitch and be able to show what he's all about as well. And and look, he'll be covering anywhere from 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 ten to fifteen. So really excited about about this weekend. And and, and again, another opportunity for us to stress test where we are. And I'm I'm hoping that we are where we are, and I'm not and, and I'm not wrong here. Ian Chisholm, well, early days, of course, at Peebles, but he's certainly having an impact and, of course, having two home games back-to-back, that's, that's great for them. Yeah, I think he is having an impact and um, I, I'm gutted that I'm not able to play rugby under Ian Chisholm. I think he's he's got a great... There's still time. No, there's not. There's um, <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a great way about him, great rugby knowledge. I think the guys are really buying into it and I think that he has got. he's the one thing that Peebles have lacked for so many years is actually having a rugby guy leading leading it and, and taking it by you know we had we had Gary Parker who was he was a really good coach and he, he motivated you but you always felt that he wasn't fully invested you know I think the probably the last rugby guy we really had was Bruce McNaughton he was he was great his, his man management was sometimes questioned by some players but you know he, he really really he re- really drew you in and he, he taught you rugby and I think sometimes that's lost with with some clubs mainly because of personnel and I think people's are are very, very fortunate to have uh, Ian Chisholm as a head coach. Peebles then at home to Dumfries. Now, two weeks ago, we saw Hoyt Lindeen's game called off due to the lack of a referee, and that brought things into sharp focus again that this area and other areas are desperately short. So I invited the chairman of the Borders Referee Society, Stephen Turnbull, to come in and have a frank chat with me last week. Well, Stephen, the, the last time we spoke, um, you used the word crisis as a possible for the future um, would you say that we're now actually using that word crisis we've talked for many seasons Stuart about the precarious situation we're in with the availability of match officials in the borders and indeed across the the whole country and actually the last time we kind of talked about that word crisis and we didn't think we were quite at that point though we did have diminishing numbers however I would say quite candidly that, that we are at crisis level. We simply do not have enough match officials to, to service the game in the borders. And I know it's a national issue. I know that other parts of Scotland are, are suffering, but it is an acute issue here in the borders that, that we need to find a solution to pretty quickly. How have we got to this situation? I think there's a, a number of factors around. I, I think it's been happening over the course of a number of seasons that people are finding other avenues. For example, we've got players who are playing for longer or are going on to do other roles within clubs. Uh, we've also had COVID over the past, I would say, two and a half years, which has exacerbated the issue because people have found other hobbies and things to do and people have found that actually family life on a Saturday is probably more interesting now than than refereeing. So there's a number of different factors that play into this. I think quite fundamentally, though, and something we probably haven't been as, as candid with is that, that clubs haven't taken enough responsibility for supporting the, the development of referees or, or the pathways for referees and people moving into to, to match officiating across across the borders. And um, we've just sent out a letter to all clubs in the borders asking them to take some personal responsibility to make sure that we can have referees available both in the, the immediate term but also the medium to longer term as well so that we can continue to service the game down here in the borders. What can they actually do, the, the, the clubs themselves? What, what are you looking for them to do? I think there's a number of steps that clubs can take and clearly they can be supported by the referee society who are responsible for all- allocating to the regional leagues and the under-18 leagues down here in the borders. And, and of course, the, the national setup sits with the SRU in terms of National 1 down to, to National 3 and, and, and Premiership added into that as well. However, locally, what we, we're trying to encourage clubs to do is to have an appointed 
club referees. So in seasons gone by, uh, the, the clubs were encouraged by the SIU and indeed some funding came alongside that, that they had somebody allocated to the club in the event that they did not get a referee from the society, they could then cover that game. But also, actually, more simply than that, it's, it's about identifying, for example, fringe players who are perhaps on the periphery of playing and and, and perhaps are not making the first or second teams that actually could step in and do at least one or two fixtures a month would help enormously. But also those who are coming towards the end of their playing career or are or, or trying to return through injury and, and going to undertaking some condition. And actually those are the kind of people that we need to encourage into the game because they have the experience and the knowledge of the game inside out. And actually if we, we reflect back from from a refereeing perspective and what the players expect, they expect empathy and those those particular individuals can provide that and, and help facilitate the game on the park. Of course, we must mention about the uh, the abuse which we've been trying to stamp out of the game as well. We know that uh, everything's you know put in the programmes. There's there's notices saying it won't be tolerated. I've heard announcements at grounds that it won't be tolerated. And then about ten minutes later, we hear some of the more vociferous people, um, you know, giving it loudly with the referees, and and that has I know for a fact um, led to a few referees giving it up. I'd previously written out to clubs and indeed it was probably towards the end of last season when we saw an increase in, I would say, passions returning from from the absence of amateur rugby over the course of the COVID pandemic and actually those passions probably spilling into something that, that, that constitutes more direct abuse towards match officials. So we have seen a rise in it. The SRU took action on, on the back of uh, some complaints from referees themselves and did put out um, communications and directives from, from Gavin Scott at the SRU which only goes so far. And actually, if I, if I talk about responsibility on clubs in, in terms of referees and, and trying to provide referees, actually it goes much broader than that. It's about creating that culture and atmosphere around the club that we expect everybody to see and, and which is a, a, encompasses everybody, including match officials, and it's quite an inclusive environment. So I, I guess we're seeing a rise of it. I, I think it's down to passion more than direct abuse. Um, I think one of the, the issues is that... that Clearly, when, when clubs are perhaps on the receiving end of a defeat, for example, then tensions run higher, or indeed if they've they've been uh, on the receiving end of uh, some decisions that they perhaps don't agree with. But I w- what I would say in all of that is, is that actually uh, th- there's a balance between passion and abuse. And I think if people can remain passionate about the game, which is what we expect and want, but actually don't direct it towards the match officials. They're there to do a job. They referee what's in front of them. They have no preconceptions about what they're going into referee nor do they have any grievances towards any clubs or players. So actually, nothing is deliberate. We're all human. Referees make mistakes. And we've, through Borders Rugby Television and indeed radio, have, have, have highlighted some some challenges of decisions that have perhaps been mistakes in games. And, and we've come out and, and, and admitted that. And on behalf of the referees and the clubs, we've tried to rectify that by explaining what the decision was. So... I think if we can be proactive in, in explaining what we're trying to do from a referee's perspective, we then ex- expect clubs to be inclusive and, and, and take account of the fact that referees, like everybody, like players who make a number of errors on the park and missing tackles or forward passes or knock-ons, referees are human and we make mistakes. But of course, if there is abuse on, on the park, you can throw a yellow card at someone or a red card at someone and that's dealt with there and then. But of course, you can't get to the back of the stand or whatever where some of the uh, the spectators are, are in, in a free-for-all, basically. And the referee has a number of tools, if you just alluded to, the, you know, if, if there is direct abuse, and we've seen this in seasons gone by, indeed, the, the start of this season, that if, if a player directly abuses a match official or swears at them directly, then, then that will be a red card. Or indeed, if there is other behaviours are in the park that, that are not conducive to the game of rugby or are not in the spirit of the sport, then we can yellow card people and send them to the sin bin. But you're absolutely right that, that we don't have control over spectators. So again, that's... That's where the clubs come in. And that's where the clubs need to take responsibility. We we can, of course, if, if, there are a, if there is abuse during the game by, for example, the coaching team committee or those close to the pitch, then we can submit to the SIU as officials a, a match official abuse form and that is dealt with through the same disciplinary process as a red card for example however again I, I reiterate the point that that we expect clubs to create the environment that we all want to see and in particular if we're trying to set an example for for young people or, or children who are around the clubs that is not shouting abuse at the referee nor is it shouting abuse at, at, at players and I've, I've seen that uh, particular example before so 
I think we all just need to to enjoy the fact that we're back to full uh, a full calendar of rugby and indeed a, a very long calendar of rugby but but actually just enjoy it and, and, and embrace everybody for, for what they can offer to the game now, what's the latest on, say, National 1, 2 and 3? Because uh, in previous seasons, pre-COVID, we had officials uh, turning up at the National 1 as well. Then it was changed, wasn't it, so that each club in National 1 had to provide their own, uh, well, touch judge rather than assistant referee because they could only do so much effectively. And that was really, Kate, that came out of, again, a lack of referees. What, what, Where are we now as far as National 1 is concerned? So clearly in my role as, as president of the Referee Society, but also the, the president of the Scottish Rugby Referees Association, which is a collective body for all six referees society across the country. I have regular discussions with the SRU and mm-hmm. and indeed my my informal conversation with clubs highlights that, that assistant referees returning to National One in particular would be very beneficial. However, it comes down to the fundamental. There is just not enough officials. We have an assistant referee panel. We have referee panels nationally and then we have a high performance setup so all those different panels service everything from super six right down to national three and and whilst we we manage to encourage more people who are perhaps not not as agile or or, or don't think they can can last a full game of rugby to move into an assistant referee role which in terms of the fitness and and the agility is probably less intensive uh, we simply don't have that 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 continuous supply coming through and actually what we're noticing is we need a lot of those officials who are perhaps coming to the end of their career who but can still serve as some of the local games across the country in terms of the regional setups. We need them to come back down and support that. So if we want to have a, a flow of match officials throughout the country and, and assistant referees, particularly at National 1, and we see the benefit of them at, at, at Premiership, and uh, then we, we've got to have that supply coming through. And I think if we look at the role of an assistant referee, it, it does aid the, the, the referee on, on the pitch. Um, I don't think they have as much of an influence as people perhaps on the touchline think, and they have primary duties, which of course, um, for those who don't know, is obviously the, the touch and touch and go and then kicks at goal. But aside from that, they can add some, some, some support to the referee. For example, if you're slightly behind play and miss that forward pass or knock on, then they can help support that. But generally, in terms of the management of the game, and particularly around the breakdown and the ruck, we don't expect the assistant referees to be inputting um, recommendations for decisions by the referees. So I think if we look at them as a whole, it's a really good development pathway for those who are moving into higher level games or perhaps falling out of the higher level setup to, to gain more experience, but also just uh, assist, the, assist the referee as well in, in those particular areas. So what is the worst case scenario then if nothing happens between now and the end of the season? What, what What's the situation there? And then let's flip it on its head and say, well, you know, what, what are you looking for which could make things a lot better? So I think the first thing is we've already seen uh, a couple of game cancelled, games cancelled over the, the past couple of weekends. That trend will continue. And, and indeed, I was just speaking to our allocation secretary who does an unenviable task of trying to find referees week in, week out, and actually personally approaching people to try and get them to take on some responsibility. And and looking at the next few weeks, I, I think we might cover this weekend just, but again, that's relying on support from other societies who are also struggling, um, and, and also relying on some of the clubs to try and provide somebody who's qualified to, to do games. But if I look at the next couple of weeks ahead and indeed into October, there is no chance at this present moment that we will fulfil all the games. I think we have a core, uh, and this is quite a staggering figure, of about five match officials in the borders who referee week in, week out. And that doesn't take account of people's availability, which obviously, for a number of reasons, uh, changes. So if I take that trajectory of those core match officials and the number of games we've got to fulfil, which probably on average is about 10, fluctuates, but but can go up to 16 then, then we're simply not going to cover games and, and we can't rely on other referee societies who are experiencing similar issues to us to, to always plug the gaps. So I think the message is pretty clear now that, that we are at crisis level and therefore we need clubs to take responsibility. And as I mentioned before, people who have gone through a referee course previously and there's, there's you know, I would say, hundreds of them across clubs in the borders. Actually, we need them to step up and, and start taking on some responsibility to referee games and as a society, we've already put out a call to all of these clubs to say that we will support them through that process and we will do refresher training for all these officials and we'll do reflections and preparation for games. So actually, you know, I reiterate that message that 
if we continue with the trajectory, we simply won't fulfil all the games and games will have to be cancelled. Or we'll switch to Friday nights, Sundays? Um, switching games does help. Uh, again, I go back to the point about availability, that, that people are sometimes not available on a Saturday for a variety of reasons. However, we also switch into to Friday or Sunday does then often mean, you know, for example, I did two games this weekend past and that that level of commitment from our small group of match officials is probably not sustainable, nor does it give us resilience because like players, referees do do pick up injuries or niggles throughout the season. So I think switching to, to different days definitely does help in the short term um, where we have that commitment to do for an official to do two fixtures or, or indeed those who are not available on a Saturday can do other days. But it's certainly not a medium to long term fix going forward. OK, well, it's a, a gloomy picture, but hopefully with this uh, interview here that you've uh, raised awareness again of uh, a critical situation and hopefully we'll get people, particularly ex-players, coming forward. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. OK, that was uh, Stephen Turnbull talking to me last week. Worrying times, and it's not as if we weren't warned about this. Yeah, I think it's it's been something that's been happening for a while. Um and I'm a bit of a hypocrite because David Changling asked me when I retired and I was 23, at the, well, 20, 23 24 at the time. Um, he, he asked me about uh, refereeing and I think at the time I probably just wanted a bit of distance from the game and I, I, I wanted away. Um, I didn't word it so politely at the time when I was speaking to David Changling, but um, I did say I, I wasn't interested in refereeing. And I think in hindsight, you know, I, I probably could have done something, but I never, I've, I've done something else, which I'm, I'm, I'm happier with and it. It really did fill the rugby void that I had in terms of, you know, doing the radio and doing punditry. It's, it's been great. I've absolutely loved it. But for some people, that that rugby scratch might be etched by refereeing. You, know, you see people like Andrew Skeen getting involved. Uh, there's there's loads of loads of players. I, I think it is sometimes when I go back to my club at Peebles, and you do see some of the referees. It's still the same faces that I, I seen when I when I retired. What's that? Well, just about a decade ago. Um, so it's. It is worrying. So you know, it's it's the same thing that's been been batted about for for a, a good ten years since I've stopped playing because I've been in these discussions. But it's it's something else. Maybe needs to happen a, a new venture, something different to to allow this. I think the idea of of games on different days is is probably you know a quick fix, but doesn't it, it only papers over the cracks until until more faces show up and want to take on refereeing. Well, let's get back to matters on the pitch and into the East Leagues. Duns are at home to North Berwick in Division 1. Well, in the second division, no game for Langham, but Hoytlandine take on Livingston at Volunteer Park. In Division 3, it's a derby at Netherdale. Back pitches between Galloway and Emmerdorf, and that game kicking off at half past two. Both, of course, desperate to win, and some silverware on the line as well. You can hear what it means to both teams, starting with Earlston's Aaron Patterson. As you know, we have... Galloway M on Saturday it's a border derby everybody knows what that means everybody's up for it, everybody's excited it's enjoyable to be a part of We, us lads know that individually if we all step up there's no reason we can't walk away with a win this weekend and get ourselves moving in the right direction for the rest of the season last weekend we obviously didn't have a game the weekend before that we lost 27-5 to Inverleith there was a lot of positives to take for that, a lot of things that we certainly need to work on. We've discussed all those. They're going to be in the forefront of our mind for this gala game and for the rest of the season, making sure we're ironing out those wee mistakes, those wee things that cost quite dearly when you're playing the game of rugby. However, saying that, as I say, all the lads are up for it. Can't wait to hopefully walk away with the first win of our season and the cup itself. And uh, from a Gala YM perspective, it's head coach Stuart Walker. It was a tough day in our first league game away to Lismore uh, a couple of weeks ago now. And the we didn't quite put things together like we'd hoped to. Um, Lismore were, were strong and uh, some of the, our less experienced boys um, struggled a little bit against that. You know, a couple of weeks to regroup and training's been going really well. We've got a few boys coming back into the, the squad on Saturday, which will make a huge difference. Um you know, playing Edelston is always going to be a tough game, uh, border derby, and we're, we've been really excited about it. And as I say, preparation's been good. Um, and we're, you know, we're ready for our first home game of the season and looking forward to it. Stuart Walker there. And this one's going to be competitive and it might well be East League 3, the sort of the lower rung. But you can hear in the voices there, this means a lot to them. 
Yeah, definitely. It's still a border derby, and you can hear it from both of the both the the guys there that they they've got a lot of pride to play for, and I think that's you know adds to the mix. I think every level of rugby, it doesn't matter if it's Premiership or if it's Nat Three or if it's regional rugby, it's still a game of rugby. You know, these guys are still going out there. And there's a lot of pride at stake. There's, you know, they want to enjoy themselves, which is is the main thing. And I think even though you're if you're an elite athlete, you're doing it because you enjoy it. You work because you enjoy it. And if you've got your hobby, you've certainly got to enjoy it. And that's what these players are going out there to do. They want to, you know, have that competitive edge. They want to get their upper hand on their opposite man, but they also want to enjoy it. And sometimes that level of rugby is probably the purest and the best because they can, as soon as he's finished, you know, that beers in the club rooms, there's probably more social in, in, in that level of rugby than there is in, in some of the, the, the upper reaches of, of uh, national rugby. So, you know, everybody's got, it's certainly got a place everywhere, but it's going to be an interesting game. And, you know, Stuart Walker, who's the, the Gala YM coach, he's got had a lot of experience with uh, Edinburgh Ackies. Used to play against them a lot in, in, in youth rugby, actually. So now I know the face to the name. It's, uh, you know, he's certainly a good rugby player. So hopefully he brings, you know, another external influence into that level of rugby at Gala YM. OK, and in the final Division 3 game, it's Hoyt Quinns. Long-awaited return after a year off. They visit Lismore. And just before the programme, I caught up with Captain Adam Hall. This is obviously the, the big moment for Hoyt Carla Quinns because this is your, your first match since the return, as far as the league's concerned. Yeah, it's exciting. It's been a lot of hard work to get a team on the pitch, but we're, we're looking forward to Saturday. What's it been like getting the, the Quinns back again? It's been a real lot of hard work. I think a lot of the committee and players have um, have been doing a lot of phoning, knocking on doors, speaking to people to try and get this back up and running again. But um, we've been quite flexible with players with regards to training and availability. And a lot of guys have, have came back in the notion that they can play when it suits them. And I think that suits us as well. As long as we're getting 15 players on the pitch on a Saturday, we're quite happy. And this obviously is the first one. It's quite a long season ahead. Are you confident you're going to fulfil everything? I think so. I think, yeah, the first week, unfortunately, we had to call off against um, Trinity because we had a spate of unavailabilities, a few injuries, um, people on holiday, work commitments. But I think now we're into the middle of September and people's commitments, there's no golf and things like that. I think we're quite confident that we're going to get a team week in, week out this year. What you were mentioning about the the uh, Trinity Aki's game and, and being deducted, of course, that this has happened a lot over the last few years. It's a rule which is controversial because it kind of penalises clubs that are trying their best to get people on the pitch and sometimes through no fault of their own, they're penalised and that has another knock-on effect. What's your own thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it is, it's quite disappointing that, we, that we've been ducked points just for, for one unfulfilment, um, but... Arguably, it's it does kind of set a precedence, and people could pull out if they maybe didn't think they had a good team and so on. But maybe at the lower end of the, the um, structure, it's a rule that's definitely worth looking at. Well, we certainly wish you well. It's great for history as well for the club because a lot of people were, were looking at the decision, you know, over twelve months ago and thinking, well, you know, we might ne- never see the Quins back again. Um, but luckily, you've bucked the trend, and let's hope that it's uh, it's the start of a, a very uh, worthwhile. And, and long campaign for you. Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Stuart. That was Adam Hall from Hoyt Quinns. We wish them all the best in their first game of the season, the first game that they've played for a long time. Well, on Sunday, a new look Kelso ladies take to the pitch for the first time in the Caledonian Stroke Midland Stroke East League, and they begin with a long trip to Dundee to take on the Dundee Valkyries. I hope I've pronounced that right. Not really a Wagner fan, me. Earlier, though, I spoke with Captain Donna Borthwick. Um, pre-season's been good. It's been a normal pre-season. It's been hard um, going at times. The coaches have run us around a lot. We've had a lot of new people coming along during the time as well. What's the kind of spread compared with last year when you had quite a few numbers? This year we've got 32 players registered. 10 of those players that will be their first season with us. And this Sunday we've got eight new players. Last year you were in the National League. You had to withdraw from that after a while, but uh, not before we filmed you actually winning a, a game quite convincingly and putting it a few tries on the board as well which was very very encouraging but as a club you've decided to drop down to kind of regional rugby and and that must be uh, something which you're going to be targeting to eventually maybe after a couple of years get back into the national scene again yeah the reason why we dropped down was basically because we um lost a lot of players during covid and then we ended up getting a lot of new players in 
So we felt like that the new players would benefit better by dropping down and then eventually in a couple of years' time we do want to go for promotion again. Because you were very competitive, certainly in the games I watched. Yeah, definitely. We were really competitive and we had a lot of good wins and we won a couple of titles. So we're hoping to do that again um, this season. So how far down the road are we now in, in terms of women's rugby, not just Kelso ladies, but how far down the road are we from you know getting a few local derbies? I mean, we we hear about Melrose ladies, Gala Vixens and, and Hoyk have, uh, have girls coming along as well. We're seeing... You know, more and more women and, and girls who want to take part and play rugby. Where are we in the big picture locally? For Kelso, it's brilliant to see all these new places popping up with uh, women's teams because that's exactly what we want. We want to have like a border star be going on. Well, we're certainly looking forward to coming back to uh, Point de Park to, to see you perform on a Sunday in the near future. But of course, you kick off your season this coming Sunday. It's a long old trek down to Dundee to pay, play the Dundee Valkyries. <laughs> What do you know about that? Yeah, them? it's the longest it's the longest trip we're gonna to have to make this season. We're excited to see what they've got to offer and to see what we can offer with all our new players and our new team. I was going to say, I mean, what is the team news uh, for Sunday? We've got new um coaches, so Ailey Walker and Alan Frame are our new coaches, so that's exciting. We've got seventeen, I think, players playing uh this Sunday, so it's exciting. There's eight of them. That it's their first game. I think the older players, the more experienced players, are looking forward to taking more of a leadership role and uh, helping out the newer players that are coming through. Because we're always welcome new players, so um, it is good to see them along. But it's a long trip for them for their first time out. If if people are interested in taking part and want to join Kelso Ladies, what do they have to do? Uh, we train every Wednesday and Friday. Um, sometimes the location changes, so it's either Croft Park or at, down at Pounder Park. But they're best to just follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Send us a message, we'll get back to them. We wish you all the best for the season and uh, obviously on Sunday, with that long trip to Dundee, and we'll catch up with you when you're back down in Kelso again. Yeah, our first home game is the first weekend in October. And we'll be there for that one. Donna Borthwick, captain of the Kelso Ladies. Well, finally, just talking of women's rugby, congratulations to all selected for the Scotland Women's World Cup squad, including, of course, Lisa Thompson, Chloe Rowley and uh, Lana Skeldon representing the Borders. Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's it's good to have that inclusion because it's something that's perhaps, you know, it, it gets lost amongst the more traditional men's game. It's it, it's going to have to take time to, to really grow and get the, the attraction from, you know, younger females who want to play rugby. But it, it does seem to be becoming a, a lot more attractive. You see the, the, the team's likes of uh, Watsonians and Hillhead. They've got a long tradition of, of, of female success at that game, perhaps a bit too much because of the lack of competition elsewhere. But... You know, from a Borders point of view, it's great to see some some familiar names and some familiar faces there in the squad. And it, it'll just be a matter of time before, you know, it has that similar surge. Or it, hopefully it's a matter of time before it has that similar surge to like what to women's football's had. Um, but time will tell. But uh, well done to the three that, that got in the squad. Absolutely. Well, that's it for today. My thanks to uh, Dale Clancy. Uh, do join us live for Borders Rugby Special tomorrow at two o'clock for three hours of rugby from Netherdale. It's Gala against Aberdeen Grammar in National One. We'll be back next Friday for our Friday rugby preview. But for now, from East Stuart Cameron and Dale Clancy, bye for now. Bye.